I was thinking in terms of going to sea, a sailing ship or something like that, that's what I was interested in as a kid. But in 1940, I was in my third year at Hamilton Tech, college in Hamilton, of course, and our English teacher, can you hear me at the back all right? Yes. Yeah. Seems to be very good acoustics in here, isn't it? Yeah, it's fantastic, actually. It is, yeah, I noticed that. <laughs> okay, well, my third year at Hamilton Tech, last year, 1940, and our English teacher, who we called Gunny Martin, I'm not sure why, but I'll be probably the reason why. Anyway, Gummy <coughs> had London Illustrated News papers, and they were in full colour. They were, whereas most things in those days were black and white. But the London Illustrated News, or Illustrated London News, I'm not sure which way it's sp spoken, had all, it was completely surrounded in that room by coloured photos of thousands of, or hundreds of German aircraft that had been shot down in the Battle of Britain. It was 1940. And from then on, I think most of the kids like at my age decided they'd like to fly a Spitfire. So, <coughs> um, the next move for me was in, on the 13th of September 1941, entry to the Air Force was sort of expedited or by the inauguration of the Air Training Corps, which actually was also in Britain. Is that correct? Do you know? The Air Training Corps? I'm pretty sure it was, yep. because I had a booklet, an RAF one, called. It's quite strange. I had two books. I was quite interested as a kid, at least at that stage, in aeronautics, and I bought two commode books, and one was called The Aircraft Structure, and from that I read about biplanes and all that sort of thing, and um, so I understood the mechanics of the, the biplanes. For example, it, it mentioned there how um, that, that a biplane has flying wires and landing wires, and that if you flew upside down or inverted, the landing wires became the flying wires and vice versa. So I had no compunction at all when I was flying a tiger moth for doing an inverted spin, knowing that it wouldn't fall apart. <laughs> uh, the other book that we had, and just about summed up my knowledge of, air, of theory of flight, right into flying kitty and corks and corsairs, was Flight Without Formula. That was an early commode book. I suppose some of you have seen that book or heard of it? Yeah. So that's about our total knowledge of aeronautics, really, when we got to flying with high-speed aircraft. Now, um, yeah, okay. I've got my logbook marked here, hopefully just items to uh, bring up. Um, I actually entered the Air Force at Omarka in uh, May 43. And by November, I was at Harewood flying tiger moths here, including 1443 once. And then, following that, oh, well, in the, in the, well yeah, this is actually the page in my logbook that shows 1443, in which I did steep turns, forced landings, aerobatics, barrel roll, Roll off the top of a loop and a slow roll. That's what I did in 40, 1443 that day. Um, my instructor asked me at the end of the course if, he, if I would like to become a flying instructor, to which I declined naturally. But I did get on this page an above average for flying the tiger. So that was first accomplishment, I guess you could say. Now, 
From there on, we moved on to the harbour, as it would burn. And uh, we are February, the east, February east. February the 14th, I did my first flight at Woodburn in Harvard, and did a, one or two interesting things in Harvard. One was that just be, in 1941, we had a visit at Cambridge, where I was living at the time, of a cousin I'd never met. Um, and he was, he was on his way to Singapore it was in November 41, just a few weeks before Pearl Harbor. And we didn't, we didn't anyway realize it was going to be the Japanese war coming on. And he visited, he was from Christchurch, and he came up to Cambridge and met all our families in the Waikato. And he had a kit bag with a tennis racket sticking out of it. Because his father actually had been in the New Zealand insurance company in Singapore for some years earlier. And he was a top tennis player. In fact, I'm reading myself recently, he was the top tennis player at, in, for Malaysia or something way back then. And here's his son, Tony, that's what I think his name. And he came and visited us, heading for Singapore to play tennis and all that. But that was November, <coughs> only five weeks, say, before December 7th. <laughs> And he was shot down on the 18th of January in a Brewster Buffalo. And he was flying in the New Zealand 488 squadron, whereas Jeff Fiskin, who most of you have heard of, and he shot down six planes flying the Brewster Buffalo, but he was in an RAF squadron. Anyway, T Tony had the distinction of being one of the first pilots shot down in 488 squadron. In fact, that followed the death of my cousin Kevin Cox in Hamilton, who I knew well, and he was had the dubious distinction of being the first pilot to be killed in 485 Squadron in England on Spitfire. And that was a tragic flight where his brother, the old memory from names and things, Bernard, Bernard was in the Navy, the Royal Navy, and Bernard, when they formed 485 Squadron, and Kevin was flying the old Spit Mark Fives, I guess, and Bernard visited him <coughs> at the airfield, Lincolnshire somewhere, Lincolnfield, I think it is, and Kevin took his brother up in the Miles Magister for half an hour for a flight, and then he hopped into the his Spitfire, but it wasn't his normal one. He normally flew what was called the Hamilton Spitfire. Like in those days, each town in New Zealand more or less subscribed to a Spitfire. And he was normally flying the Hamilton Spitfire, but uh, it was in for maintenance or something. And in a letter my auntie received from one of the officers, there was some, some dubious situation regarding this plane that he flew and it spun in and killed him and that flight in his logbook, and I've got a copy of that, lasted five minutes. <laughs> so he had this dubious distinction of being the first one killed in a Spitfire. That was 1941. Now, well, uh, anyway, I personally started flying Woodburn in uh, February 44, and um, it was about three or four months, I'll just see here. <coughs> uh, uh, June, March, April, May, June, okay. So we had four months on Harvard. In that time, I flew 61, wasn't it, Russell? Thanks. 30 was the, of the Harvards, or was oh. 60 of the, the P40s, I think. So. No, it was 31 P40s. Was that? Now, I'm pretty sure it was 61 Harvards. Anyway, so we, I did what, about four months there on the Harvard, and uh, thoroughly enjoyed that. But, oh yes, Tony, the one that went to Singapore, 
that was 41, the Harvards were brand new. And he said <coughs> that they dived the Harvard to 300 MPH, which is, a, looking at it now, it's about 70 miles an hour beyond its V and E, actually. However, I decided, seeing we wore parachutes and things those days, that I emulated him, and so one day I actually dived the Harvard to 300 and you could count all the ribs out on the wing, it was interesting. That <laughs> 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 proved that the Harvard could be dived to three hundred. <laughs> anyway. I didn't have much else to sort of comment on in flying the Harvard. I found them quite easy to fly and pleasant and all that sort of thing. But the next move was to the P-40s. Now, this is an interesting one where we arrived at Ahakia on the 2nd of August, never having sat or touched the Kitty Hawk, and I flew one the next morning on the 3rd. So that's the amount of preparation to fly a P 40 with a VE of 485. And to enter a loop, that's about all we knew about it is what's in here. That's the sum total, it's all in here. But I, I still remember that the loop speed on the P-40 was 300 for a loop and 330 for a roll off the top. So quite a jump from Harvard. But we only had one day's preparation. <laughs> Before flying the P-40, I flew in Harvard 1061. And Harvard 1061 now resides in Australia. On the second, I did a flight, my first flight in a, at Ohakia, number 4 ATU, was in a Harvard 1061, and my pilot was Bob Martin. And Bob Martin was one of the first four pilots to shoot down Japanese Zero. Our P-40s, on their first day in combat, actually destroyed four Zeros. People criticised the P-40. Anyway, that's happened, and, and Bob was one of those four pilots. However, he checked me out in the Harvard 1061. Now, I saw 1061 going through the back, the back of that one in front. Here we are. Yeah. I saw 1061 go through Ardmore in 1973. I think it was, on its way to Australia, Kelvin Stark ferried it over there. The, the, the Aussies, as you probably all know, didn't have Harvards, they had Wiraways they built, more or less a copy of a Harvard, but not exactly, different motor, I think. Anyway, uh, about a dozen of our Harvards have gone over to Aussie, and between 2007 and 2010, my wife and I lived over in Australia for four years. And in 2009, I think it was, I was wondering where Harvard 1061 was. So I went on Google and I just typed in Harvard NZ 1061. And it came up with the owner's name and the location in New South Wales. And I phoned him up. And he said he was going to Timor in a few weeks' time, and if I went there, I could go for a flight in it. Now, there's 1061 in Australia there. These are all in Australia, these ones. And so that is actually the Harvard that I flew to <coughs> be checked out to fly a P-40. Now, I think quite an interesting observation is that the amount of flight time we had in the logbook, which was very minimal, for example, before flying a P-40, <coughs> pilot 100 by day, 105 hours, that's it, and at night 8.35, so for 113 hours, pilot in command to fly a plane that could dive to 485 mph <laughs> and do loops at 300. Minimal time, very much so. People, you know, think 
And a lot of the public seem to think that in the Air Force you'd always fly the same plane. Well, hardly ever did you say to fly the same registration twice in a row. Very seldom. <laughs> in fact, on the 2nd of August I did a flight with Bob Little and then I did a solo one, sector reco, that means sector reconnaissance, in other words looking around at the territory, the terrain around the Archaea so I don't get lost. The next morning I did another sector reco and that afternoon I flew two P-40s. So it was pretty minimal time in, in the logbook to fly such an aircraft. And then, uh, that was the third, and on the fourth I flew two more P-40s, on the fifth I flew two more P-40s, and I didn't, we were not very aware of the models of P-40, they were just numbers written up on the flight room or whatever, the flight room, and you went out and flew it. No idea really what whether an M or N or K. It wasn't until years after the war that I learnt about the difference between the different models. <laughs> Except that at one model P-40, some of you probably know more about this than I do, where I hopped into it and there was no pitch lever. <laughs> it had an automatic, completely automatic prop mechanism. But I have read that they were not very popular in air combat, that model. And for those who are interested, I don't know why, I think there was a good reason. The tachometer, when you had, all you had was a throttle. And the tachometer sort of moved in jumps, it didn't come nice and smooth. There's an electrical reason for that, apparently. So, uh, according to, I've got it recorded here now that the first one I flew was an M, and the next one was an N, and the next was N, and the next an M, and the next K. So I flew M's, N's, and K's in the first five flights, and one, two, three, four, five, six flights. I didn't start to fly the same one twice, they were each one with different registrations. So that was my introduction to the P-40. I could talk quite a bit about flying P-40s, but I'll probably run out of time. How much do I have? I mean, is it half an hour, is it? Yeah, you still got another 10 minutes or so. Okay, well, I better keep moving on. Um, well, I made, I've created two records, possibly never experienced by anyone else, of doing having a P-40 stall after three minutes. <laughs> <laughs> I remember I taxied out at a hark air, they'd give you, or you'd call on radio for taxi and then you know, watch the tower for a green light and I was only halfway through my checks and the green light came and he started to pump flashing on and off because he had something coming in up presumably so I, I just assumed that he was in a hurry to get me airborne so I really only barely did the checks and they got on and took off and when I got airborne in the P-40 after Harvard, I was sort of semi-mesmerized by this long nose out front. <laughs> They've got a carburetor air intake that sits at the top of the engine. Some of you know what I'm talking about. God Seagull went in there occasionally. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so I was climbing out, probably to about 2,000 feet a minute, and um, not even looking inside the cockpit, wasn't even looking at the snows. And then well, I turned towards Parnison on my right, so I just rolled into a turn. The next minute, the horizon went <laughs> like this, stalled. <laughs> but in the Harvard, we absolutely thrashed them with snap rolls. Like doing instrument flying, for example, as two students in the Harvard, <coughs> Some, well, you did it with either an instructor or another student, a safety pilot. And we used to do cage the gyros. In the wartime aircraft, you had to gauge the two gyros, the, the artificial horizon and the DI, direction indicator. You had to cage those. And with them caged, we could have the student doing loops on basic panel, just using the turn needle and using that, and you could do a loop. Well. 
has a safety pod at the top of that loop and slam the stick back and kick full rudder and cartwheel it and say, you have control. <laughs> <laughs> and that was how he taught unusual attitudes by snap rolling a Harvard in this. Anyway. P40s. Oh, the other one that possibly no one's beaten me at was the fact that just prior to being flying the P40, we'd, uh, we got had our wings at Woodburn, and I was an NCO, flight sergeant, or sergeant then, and we had a whole month at Levin. And at Levin, every morning at 9 o'clock parade, one of the boys that had been there and went to Harkey would come over and do screeching dives over the parade ground. So I decided to do this on my second or third flight in a Kitty Hawk. And climbed out of a hack here and got to 13,000 feet over the wind. And I just pull the nose up and do a vertical dive on the parade ground. I still remember seeing the ASI going past 450. <laughs> but when I, I, I didn't know the mathematics then of the fact that at 5,000 feet you're one mile high, and if you're doing 400 and 420, say, that's seven mile a minute. And from being vertical that way to that way, you had a seventh of a minute. Never, I wasn't aware of that sort of, but I soon learned because the ground came up. Well, on the second of these flights, I hauled back so, so um, energetically that I sort of woke up heading that way. <laughs> but, a funny thing happened where I glanced at the, um, not the cylinder head temp, the coolant temp. Of course there we had cylinder head temp, but the Kitty Hawk was a coolant temp, temperature gauge, and the thing was reading zero. Well, that's funny. I must have dived so fast that I overcooled it, so I put it into a steep climb, everything to warm an engine, I leaned the mixture and climbed at a slow speed but at a high rate of climb. And I got back to about 13,000 feet quickly, and the temperature gauge was still on zero. That's funny. So I immediately thought I'd better get back to a Harkia. So I put the nose down, and I was whistled over the top of a Harkia doing about 300, and I'd pull the nose up, and I, and I went back and forth trying to slow the thing down. <laughs> and then I couldn't get the tower on the radio, so it struck me it must be electrical. And there was a plastic cover on the instrument panel that I'd never even looked at before. It was actually circuit breakers. And in my pull-out, I threw all the circuit breakers off. <laughs> 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 and, uh, I've read plenty of books about flying P-40s, and I've never heard of anyone else that's ever thrown the circuit breakers off. <laughs> uh, it's hard to understand, though, how Curtis would build an aeroplane where by pulling a tight manoeuvre, you could throw the switches off. <laughs> well, I did, anyway. Anyway, that's my memory of flying P-40s. Let's see what the next is. Uh, on my 20th birthday, as most of you know, if you've read my books, we lost eight aircraft, and this is the page that covers that. Black <coughs> uh, Tapping it very briefly, of course, we had the chap shot down in the morning of uh, Rabau swimming. And <coughs> I've been American cat Lena. I actually heard the American black cat pilot call saying requesting landing and pick up the, the downed pilot. And I was flying with Paul Green, the CO, and um, he said negative because it would have been suicidal for the black cat, about a kilometre off, surrounded by 100,000 Japanese and guns and things. And so they sent a Ventura bomber over, got the natives to make bamboo rafts to float. He couldn't even use his life raft because it was a bright colour. And only surrounded by 100,000. <laughs> and uh, so the Ventura came in, and Paul Green, who I was flying with, he led it around the volcano, and I followed it, and we dropped these bamboo rafts to Frank Keith swimming in the harbour. But then, to, to stop us getting shot down, they sent 12 more Corsairs from, with the Ventura. They all arrived on the scene and they strafed the waterfront while we did the raft drop. 
the third pilot, my three of us, he went up to 10,000 feet for a radio link with Green Island, with Grev Randall his name, but, and he, when we returned, we flew into this tropical front on the way home and uh, without elaborating, only eight of us landed out of 15. And I was the youngest and the least experienced of all the pilots, but I survived it. Grev Randall, who was flying on the other side of Paul Green and my three, he was a pilot who had been a flying instructor and we all knew that his pilot grading was exceptional, not above average, but exceptional. Well, he managed to hold formation. I lost formation because to avoid a collision in the dark. And, uh, and yet he managed to hold formation with Paul Green, the CO, so we got back to Green Island, and then he crashed on the far side of the lagoon, so it was pretty tragic. Anyway, that was um, Black Monday, they call it now. Now, what's the next one I've got marked here? Maybe something. After my first tour, what, uh, we used to do a tour of three months from Ardmore, and the first tour we'd go to either Esprit du Centre in New Hebrides or Henderson Field on Guadalcanal and do a month for, to acclimatise new pilots and do squadron training. And then we'd do two months at a forward base and then come back to New Zealand. That's what the tour consisted of, three months away. And I did that three times. And the first one was Green Island for two months and then home. And the next one was to Bougainville, where we had four squadrons of Corsairs based at Bougainville. When we were doing bombing there for the Australian Army. Uh, close support bombing, where we dropped bombs with a stick about three feet in front of the bomb with the detonator. So as so as not to make massive holes in the ground, but to clear the jungle, because the Australian soldiers thought they could only see a few metres ahead in the jungle. And so our bombing there was to, well, they call them daisy cutters, and it was to clear the jungle so that the troops could see where they were going. Although we probably killed a number of Japanese at the same time. <laughs> a thousand pound bomb. We'd, that was only shallow diving from about a 40 degree dive and we'd release at 1500 feet and pull out by a thousand but you'd, you'd feel a thousand pound bomb going off in the plane of the one before you <laughs> you see the big rings going in and out and all that uh, this is a page showing entries for close support bombing, and on there it says what type of bomb and how, what weight, 1,000 pounds, 650 pounds, etc., etc., and the target, and here, description of what we did, or the results of that raid, of that flight. I actually personally dropped 39 of them. Through intelligence, they seemed to know exactly what Japanese units were where, it was quite clever, but they did somehow find out and they would actually, in the briefing, more or less mention what the Japanese targets were. Um, time, is it? Getting close. <laughs> <laughs> I had one incident on the Corsair, and that happened on Bougainville, where on the, here we go, strapped engine, 5394, that's it there. I was only carrying a 325 three pound depth charger. See, we had bombs and depth chargers, and the depth charge didn't have much metal but a lot of explosive. And that's what they wanted to clear the jungle. Well, on that flight, I had a 325 pound depth charge, but I, <coughs> straight on takeoff, and of course, there we used 40 inches of boost on takeoff. Had only two thirds power. And once we got airborne, though, if you're near the back of a formation, you push it through to about 50 inches. And at 50 inches, about 
about 250 gallons an hour fuel flow went through. <coughs> but anyway, so, and I had about 50 inches on and, and, and suddenly no noise at all. <laughs> and especially if you